And uh, it came down to this movie. Everyone was prompt. Everyone was respectful. Everyone was on time. Girl, you know why? Because they was working with you, girl. They was working with you. Do you know Kofi will make a ninja act like If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And if you are not already a part of our Bella Book Club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button. And for a small monthly fee, of five dollars you yes you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the youtube gets it if the youtube gets it now let's talk about pam grr 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 i'm from dc i told y'all anything where a r is not in the beginning of the word we will fuck it up so before i get started uh this is from i think it's from like 2000 and it was it was strange for me to look at this uh documentary that i saw of pam greer because i was like how could such a sexy you know beautiful woman be so dry you know, and I know you like dry. Pam, Pam is dry as fuck, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to put a little zhuzh on it to make it a little funny, right? But maybe along the way, I could explain to you as to why, you know, I feel why she's so dry. Look at these nails, y'all. Don't believe it. I ain't sitting in nobody's chair and get these things adhesived to my fingers. Answer, no, these is Lee press on. Wait, what do they call it now? Back in the day, they used to be called Lee Press on Nails. These is Kiss. Pamela Suzette Greer was born on May 26, 1949. That makes her a Gemini, okay? She was born in Winston-Salem. Shout out to Winston-Salem, one of my good, good Scorpio Judies is from Winston-Salem. They have um, really good people from there. Okay, she was the oldest of her siblings, Rodney and Gina. Her father, Clarence, worked as a maintenance engineer for the Air Force, and her mother was a strong-minded surgical nurse who believed in nurturing her children to be independent, especially her girls. In 1957, Pamela was eight years old when her father was transferred to a base in England. Okay, now she said that she had no troubles assimilating herself because the people over in England were infatuated with American um, culture and music. What she would do is bring her records to school and share them with her classmates. So she didn't have any trouble fitting in. Now, okay. After three years abroad, she returned to the United States to live in Denver, Colorado. Now in Denver, Colorado, she joined a gospel group or a youth gospel group called uh, The Echoes of Youth, where she met a few members of Earth, Wind & Fire to include Philip Bailey. Decided to do, as she got older, was to go to college, okay? The University of, was it, Colorado, okay? And she decided that she wanted to be a pre-med major. By happenstance, she ended up a cheerleader for the Denver Broncos. She said that she enjoyed it, okay? She said that a friend of the coach had went to the coach and said, look, I know this girl, you know, she's somewhat pretty. That's unbelievable. That is fucking unbelievable. You can't sit here and tell me that somebody thought that Pam Greer was somewhere, uh, somewhat you know, uh, attractive with them big old looks and that pretty skin. And, and it's like, 
She's so awkwardly beautiful, you know, and she talks out the side of her mouth. You know, I'm like, am I the only person that noticed that she talks out the side of her mouth? I mean, I don't mean no harm by saying it, but she does. She said she did it, she enjoyed it, but she also sort of kind of said indirectly, okay, they had to meet old black person quota, okay, because it's black men that's on the Denver, Denver Broncos team, okay, and we ain't got no black cheerleaders, so you need to get that one. When the cheerleading part was done, okay, she returned to college, and at the same time, her mother had many concerns about Pam because she felt like her daughter was horribly shy or awkward or whatever it is because you know parents see their children I must commend her grandmother for okay Pam Greer said that her family was built up of many different races and colors and um, it was important to her grandmother to not um, develop the stigma of light skin is better within her family so her grandmother made sure that no child felt better than the other. The light-skinned child was not better than the dark-skinned child. No one was better. So when, you know, as she grew, there was no, oh, you're beautiful. And if there were things that were said to her or someone else in the family to make them feel, okay, you might be an exceptional beauty, okay? The grandmother shut it down. All of us are beautiful beautiful. Nobody is no different from nobody else. I commend the grandmother, but at the same time, it manifested in Pam Greer and it gave her um, insecurity because she had these insecurities and the mother was like, wait a minute, mammy. Okay. Now you done sat around here and you done fucked children up. Okay. Now they all running around here bumping into each other, not understanding that they are beautiful, not just on the outside, but on the inside. Or not just on the inside, but on the outside. So because you know, of uh, how Pam Greer's mother felt, she decided to ask her daughter, ask her daughter because her daughter is, you know, over age. Uh, Pam, how do you feel about joining the, uh, or participating in the Colorado beauty pageant? Pam Greer said she loved it. She didn't feel any judgment. You know, nobody made her feel bad because of the way she looked. And I'm like, wait a minute, girl, this is a pageant now. All you're doing is just sitting around and being judged. But the mother felt like it would help her to come out of her shell, and indeed it did. A man named David Baumgard, someone who she considers to be her surrogate father, was the president of a major theatrical agency in LA. He thought that she would be good at acting. Her mother encouraged her to look into it. Now, okay. When she got over there to LA, she was like, okay, I'm here, you know, but I'm broke as hell. You know, I do this for a minute, mm -hmm. you know, cause I ain't got no money to be sitting around here, staying, you know, enjoying and you know partying with these fools i ain't got no money to do that so i'll stay here you know until it's done and then move on but that okay. didn't happen the universe had a bigger plan for pamela pamela stayed in la she okay. decided to enroll in ucla okay and she worked several jobs while she was there you know trying to pay her little rent and tuition ah, 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 okay now one of her jobs was to sing background vocals for bobby womack she was on uh his album i can understand it the endeavor led her led her to another background gig where she was working with sly and the family stone but she ain't want to do that she said one time she was dead and Jimi hendrix came to the door you know now she was enamored Okay, she's in there, she's like, oh shit, I'm here with all these great, you know, musicians singing backgrounds for them, you know, and that's kind of weird, because I'm like, isn't it like 1,000 people in Sly and the Family Stone, or wasn't it one? Why do you need Pam Greer to sing background for that? Girl, they put you there for eye candy, girl. Yeah. You know, she said so, you know, properly, you know, the, the drug culture, you know, was very prevalent at that time, and I did not want to fall victim to it. That's what I'm talking about, about her being dry. Girl, all you had to do was say, them niggas was getting high around there. And you go, don't get down with that bullshit. And I ain't got time to be around a mother asking me, 
You want to try? As a no so She did not want to be influenced by it. You know? I mean, you messing around. You sitting there trying to sing backgrounds. Jimi Hendrix walk up to you. And girl, Jimi Hendrix is not my type. You know, looky wise. Okay? But they say, you know, that screw game is off the chain. That's what they told me. That's what all the white women that I looked at with documentaries and, you know, all the women like that, they get stars in their eyes thinking about the Jimi Hendrix. And they ain't talking about that purple haze, y'all. Could you imagine, you know, Jimi Hendrix walking up to you, giving you a kiss in the mouth, and next thing you know, you sucking on a piece of acid? Girl! Enters Roger Coleman, okay? Roger Coleman is looking for an in-your-face as she calls it, type of female actress, okay? Now, Roger Coleman was a guy who worked on B-list movies for American International Pictures, who was founded by Sam Arkoff and James Nicholson, who made a whole lot of money on black exploitation movies. Here go Man. Quentin Tarantino. Let me tell you something. Quentin Tarantino, you gotta watch him. If you're a black woman, don't turn your back on him. Okay. Matter of fact, if you a black woman, don't work for him, cause he gonna try and he gonna try and honk your horn, girl. If you know what I'm saying, he gonna try and honk your horn. If he don't try and honk your horn, he gonna try and suck it, okay, or blow it, cause that's what you do to horns. You don't suck horns. You you blow it. Pussy Tarantino ass trying to explain black exploitation. Okay. Now, even though I used to love. Quentin Tarantino. Actually, you know what? I still love his movies because I enjoy his vision. You know, he right? comes up with a way to kind of explain black exploitation. He said that it's just a word that was coined, okay? And I would agree with him when he says that in every movie, some part of an actor is exploited. I would agree because a bitch get mad if when I see a Will Smithy movie, he don't take his shirt off. I'd be like, what kind of bullshit is this? I pay, how much does it cost to go to movies now? Fucking $20? $20 and I can't see Will Smith eat shirt off? Everybody gets exploited, even in sports. These men, they get exploited. And when they done and they can't, you know, bang their bodies around no more, they throw them away like trash. Yeah, I said it. If they're a good looking white man, they cast them in certain roles because they know that the women want to see them. So I would agree. And it just so happened that these particular exploitation movies were uh, starring black actors or actresses, okay? They put her in a movie, okay? There was a big box office hit called The Big Bird Cage. Pam Greer said that they told her that she did so good that they wanted to do two more movies with her. Okay, in which she kept all the money because that was her tuition money and she returned to UCLA where she met. Okay, girl, hold on. Let's do this name right here. Okay, hold on. We got to think hard on this. Okay. Uh, Ferdinand Lewis Alcinda Jr., you know, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. But they didn't work out, right? You know why? Because, you know, he asked her to marry him. So they were engaged, okay? But he said, no, I don't want to marry you, girl, because you don't want to convert. You know, and as, as attractive as some of them men be in prison, you'd be like, ooh, that is a waste of pickle over there in prison. You'd be like, no, eh, pass. Because you know when they come home, they expect for you to convert to be with them. <clears throat> That's not my life. Now, although she was heartbroken about, you know, the breakup between her and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, she ain't had time to soak because the movies needed her ass, okay? They needed her back in front of the camera to, I guess, make, you know, American International Pictures more money. American International Pictures were already making movies like The Mac and Superfly, so it would behoove them to just throw in a black sexy Pam Greer. The next movie they did, what is it called? What, Black Mama, White Mama? Black Woman, White Mama, which was a very successful movie, which I can't believe. I don't understand how that was successful. I don't understand how them movies was successful. So Omkoff was like, um, okay, this is a money maker right here. That goddamn Pam, ooh, yes. How many more movies we can get her in in the next three months, okay? So Pam was like, okay, I do your movies, but we need to incorporate in my community. So as a result, 
Coffee was released in 1973. One okay. by one, Pam Greer's character sought after and hunted down the drug lords that got her sister hooked on heroin. The movie cost $700,000 and ended up making, what is this, $10 million at the box office. That damn lady, that, man, that lady was the golden goose. You heard me. So now we got Samuel Jackson, Tim Reed, Quentin Tarantino, Russell Simmons, all talking about how beautiful and intoxicating Pam Greer was. Yeah. The men loved Pam Greer, of course, but we as women loved Pam Greer because she was actually our hero. Okay, you know, now we got black heroes all over the place with DC Comics and uh, what is that? You know, the X-Men or Marvel or whatever that is. You see black heroes all over the place. Look at Chad with Bozeman. Bless his heart. Bless his soul. Okay, but look at uh, Black Panther. Okay, we didn't have movies like that then. Whenever I talk to younger people and I explain to them, it was such a big deal for black folks to be in the movies or be on television Child, that we would call each other on the phone. Hey, 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 we on TV, y'all. We on TV. That's why shows like Soul Train was so important to our culture, okay? Because we, it wasn't often that we seen each other on the television, okay? And this is facts. I'm telling y'all, whenever something came on that had, I don't give a if it was just one black person in the audience, we would call each other. Turn on Channel 9, y'all. I remember my grandmother doing that, calling all of us. All the grandchildren. Baby, Sammy Davis Jr. is on television today. Baby, the Jacksons is going to be on television today. That's how serious it was for us. Now we have a Jim Brown, a Jim Kelly, and Frederick Williamson. Okay, now they were killing the action hero game. So when Pam Greer came in kicking ass, all it did was just round it off for him, okay? Now, between 1973 and 1975, she starred in seven more films, including Foxy Brown, She Be Baby, and Friday Foster. In Hollywood, she was considered one of the three most bankable women. The other two was Liza Minnelli and Barbara Streisand. That's a big deal. At 25 years old, Pam Greer was already dubbed an icon. She was the sex goddess of the 70s. Now, here comes the NAACP hating ass. Listen, I respect y'all. I respect what you do. But sometimes you ninjas need to stand down, okay? Now, you know they always got a problem when we, you know, do ninja stuff like pimps and hoes and drug dealers. NAACP. N -W NAACP feels like because we are black, we have to be bigger, better, and greater, okay? But sometimes, you know, people just want to make money, okay? And ultimately, Pam Greer said that, you know, it was a bother to her that, you know, the NAACP did not respect her craft, okay? You know she already got insecurity issues, you know? But ultimately, it didn't be come a black issue to her. It became a green issue to her. And she chose the money. I don't blame you. They'll be okay. They'll be okay. Now, Quentin interjected and said that, you know, since she left, there has not been uh, a person to replace her in regards to, you know, that in your face action hero type woman. Now, this was done around, I think it was 1999, 2000. This was the documentary I saw. Now, since then, I would say that Taraji P is or has embodied that action hero in your face type person. You know, who do you think could have replaced Pam Greer? You know, I, I, what, let me take this back. That lady is irreplaceable, okay? But Taraji P would come real close. Now, Pam began to see how shallow this industry was, okay? She was thinking that, wait a minute, these people don't like me, Pam, as a human being. They like Sheba Baby. Baby. And so, yes. You know, and she found herself being um, asked to people's home as a spectacle. You know, she said Elizabeth Taylor 
basically, you know, wanted her dead. You know, they doing the screening and, you know, her mansion and everything. But she wasn't there as Pam Greer to be respected as an actress. She was there as a prop. So in 1977, she starred alongside Richard Pryor in Grease Lightning. She played the wife of the first black race car driver. Okay, and I remember seeing that in a the theater with my mother, okay? Now, you know that her and Richard Pryor dated, but ultimately, okay, Richard, Richard Pryor, we know that ninja gets down, okay? And you know Pam Greer, she might get down in the movies. Matter of fact, she don't even get down in the movies. You know, I told you she is dry, okay? But ultimately, she couldn't deal with all his drug struggles. And I don't blame you, girl. I don't blame you. Coming home at night and, and he, he dancing in the streets? No. Answer no. Answer, no. Because they say that Richard Pryor was a stone cold doozy. Okay? You got to be a special kind of woman to deal with a man that's disrespectful. You know? Mm -mm. Answer no. That's not my life. Now, during her hiatus from the movies, she became very good friends with Miss Minnie Rippleton. Pam described many... Many, I'm sorry, as her first woman friend. She went through the woes of cancer with her until she died. I remember that. Hmm, that still breaks my heart. So in 1980, David Ross recruited her for a Paul Newman film called Fort Apache in the Bronx, okay, where she played a prostitute. She took that role very seriously and did tremendous research. The director was very excited to have Miss Pam Greer for the film. Okay, because he said that he had um, interviewed just about every black, beautiful actress in the, you know, I guess in the industry. Okay, but nobody was beautiful and could hit the part. Pam Greer hit the part, Tarantino again. In 1990, he reached out to Pam Greer because he was working on this movie called Pulp Fiction. Pam old goody goody, so she ain't gonna say what the truth was, okay? The truth was she ain't get the part because she ain't get on the couch, okay? The part she was supposed to have was uh Roseanne Arquette's part. I know you're like, who was that? I I don't know. I don't know. She was like the junkie wife, something like that. But that was supposed to be Pam Greer's part. Ultimately, she ain't get it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it ain't gonna work, but you know, I'll keep you in mind. Mm-hmm. Answer. Mm -hmm. So, even though that didn't work in 1996, she starred in a movie called Original Gangster. Okay? It was Slaughter, Foxy Brown, Shaft, and Superfly together kicking ass to help the young people uplift the community against violence. You know what? I still haven't seen that movie. After that, Quentin Tarantino started working on the script. Okay? Now, he kept... Pam Greer in mind, for real, for real, he's probably thinking maybe she's ready to give up the now, okay? But uh, he kept Pam Greer in mind, okay? And it was an all-star cast, okay? Now, he sent the script to Pam. Pam, do you like the script? Pam said, it's a beautiful script, but which part am I going to play? Quentin Tarantino said, you're going to be the main part, baby. And the script... Jackie Brown, if you haven't seen it, is about a stewardess who looks very good, but she time enough for all these ninjas that's trying to get at her, okay? She is outsmarting all of them to get to this, you know, couple of million dollars, all right? And I love the movie. It had all the heavy hitters. It had Michael Keaton in it. I think it's, uh, what's his name? David Forrester in it. Robert De Niro in it. Samuel Jackson, Bridget Fonda. So many heavy hitters, right? Now, what she said, meaning Pam Greer said, was that, you know, some of these actors had poor reputations of not showing up, not taking their job seriously. But when uh, it came down to this movie, everyone was prompt, everyone was respectful, everyone was on time. Girl, you know why? Because they was working with you, girl. They was working with you. Do you know... Kofi will make a ninja act right? It's, it's astounding to me that Pam Greer does not understand her power, okay? Jackie Brown, I thought, was exceptional for her. It was, it was a wonderful movie. I love it. I think I'm going to watch it today. Okay? Listen, 
If I was working on the set, I would act right, and I don't act right for nobody. Now, between okay. 1997 and 1998, she appeared in more films to include Harvey Keitel's Holy Smokes and In Too Deep with Omar Epps. And in 1998, she worked on the black version of Cheers, a, a Showtime series where she starred next to Tim Reed and Tisha Campbell. They said Lynx was like the black Cheers, if you guys remember it, you know? It was a bar in D.C. says that, you know, she feels like she is open to relationships, but she's not pressed for a relationship. What she would like to do is raise children, okay? And to continue working uh, her craft, okay? Now, you know, I personally want to hear you sing, Pam. Have anybody heard Pam Grier sing? I've never heard her sing. But at any rate... If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. Now, remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down, my naysayers, my patron loves. You babies, have a good one. Peace. Yeah.